welcome to The Hair Loss Show. Dr. Russell Knudsen and Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash discuss issues relating to hair loss and the medical and surgical treatment of hair loss in both men and women. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Hair Loss Show. Uh, welcome to episode number 58. So today we're going to talk about a question that we've been asked uh, well, a couple of questions that we've been asked a number of times uh, on the channel. One to talk about something called exosomes and the other one to talk about a substance called RU58841. And commonly people are asking, what are our thoughts on, on this? So do you want to take exosomes and I'll uh, handle RU58841? Sure, absolutely. Uh, let's go for that. So I won't surprise those of you who are very interested in doing research that you um, see about all of these new things being trialed all the time, because let's face it, um, anybody who comes up with the cure for, for baldness is guaranteed to have billion dollar income. So there's a lot of interest out there. Um, not so much from the main research in universities because they're interested in what they would consider to be more serious um, diseases, but people out there in the biologics field and regenerative medicine are very interested in um, something that progresses with age, which is um, hair loss. So it's not a surprise that there's a lot of information out there about it. And what we're going to try and do is demystify the process so you understand that the first time you hear about something isn't exactly the time that you know that you should be using it. So I'm going to talk about exosomes, which has been a topic, a hot topic for the, uh, most of the last year. And the thing about exosomes is that I'm not going to get too technical because it really doesn't help. But basically, there's a way that cells communicate with each other. And there are a number of ways they do. But one of the ways they do is by making a small little bubble, which we call the vesicle and the vesicle diffuses or finds its way through the, the cell wall and goes on to the next cell and it's a form of communication if you like. And so now that, the, now that we've discovered the, these things, now we try and work out what they actually do. And so in regenerative medicine, they're trying to see whether these communication things are gonna be useful in inflammation conditions, for example, or degenerative conditions. But also the, the other thing they found is that these bubbles that are naturally occurring, you can actually put something inside them and use them as a carrier. So because the natural state of the exosome is to communicate and go between cells, if you want to target a uh, therapy to a cell, you put it inside an exosome and get the exosome into the body and let the exosome do the rest, which is transport it around the body for you. So that's kind of the theory behind it. Now, when you're talking about something like male pattern hair loss, really what they're trying to do is say, well, okay, we're not really doing it for drug therapy so much at the moment, what we're trying to do it for is stem cell therapy. So there's a variety of different ways that exosomes are made at the moment. And this is the same problem we have with platelet-rich plasma, PRP, is there's a variety of ways to do it. And there's no standardization of what you're even using. So some of it comes from placent, placental uh, cord. Uh, some of it comes from bone marrow. Some of it just comes from blood products. So there's a variety of ways that you can uh, get these stem cells and um, they aren't cheap, which is worth remembering as well. Um, so the one that is getting a lot of uh, publicity in the US um, uses um, stem cells derived from bone marrow. Now, in theory, that's a good thing because the stem cells from bone marrow uh, are very we, we, it, it, we say plastic, which means they can go in any number of directions, right? They're like a master cell that can differentiate down into different areas. So that's, that's handy to have on one level because you can target the therapy that you want. But it's confusing to me um, about whether that's a superior technique to actually taking a stem cell that is already in a hair follicle, which is a differentiated and therefore specialized stem cell, expanding that population and injecting it into the skull. So I'm not sure really whether the master cell from the bone marrow is going to be better than using a cell that comes from the hair itself. So the first thing to understand about exosomes is when people are using exosome therapy, you're not using your own body's product. So with PRP, you're using your own body's product. With dermorality, you're using your own healing. With exosomes, it's coming from something else, someone else, okay? Now that can be safe because of the way they treat it, but it's not your internal therapy, that's somebody else's product being used in your body. 
The second thing to say about it is that for anything in hair, and we keep emphasizing this in episode after episode, given that the life cycle, the growth cycle of a hair is between two and five years, nothing happens over a few months. If you really want to see whether something works, you've got to study it for years. So when you see videos on YouTube of extolling the virtues of um, exosomes and look at the results we have after six or eight months, you're entitled to be a bit sceptical because you can get some people that will respond quickly, some people respond slowly, but you don't know whether it's a consistent response and you don't know how long the response is going to last. So for those of you out there who are excited about the potential of exosomes, fine. But if you're considering treating, decide whether you're the person that's prepared to be the guinea pig, which means you're part of the experimental process to find out whether they really work and they're not cheap, or whether you want to be the person that waits until the evidence is there, that it's effective and it lasts for a long period of time and therefore it's um, value for money, well spent. So is, I mean, you know how stem cells is the holy grail <clears throat> in terms of, you know, managing hair loss or, or is, is exosome, are exosomes stem cells? Exosomes are uh, spherical um, carriers that have, uh, that have introduced inside them mm. stem cells. And as I said, whether that would be superior to using hair stem cells that we are currently expanding. So the, th the thing to remember about this is we've been asked for the last 25 years, you know, you know, when's, you know, hair multiplication going to happen? When's stem cell therapy going to happen? And the answer is not sure, because every time we've done the animal models, remember everything that's reported is an animal model first. The animal models, models have been far more promising than when we went mm. to the human models, right? We had any number of car crashes where it looked really promising uh, in the animal model and then failed to work in the, uh, in the, uh, the human model. It, and it, it was only a, in 2013 that we changed the way we were preparing the cells, which meant that, the, that, that if you're doing cell multiplication, you couldn't culture them for more than 14 days. Well, that's of no use to you whatsoever because after 14 days, they become useless. So going forward, it's not that we won't crack the code on stem cells, we're just not close. And we're not even sure yet whether putting stem cells into the hair follicle and boosting them because once you've got less than 50% of your original stem cells in the hair follicle, you're not going to have a healthy hair ever again. So the question is, if we've got some of the patient's stem cells and we supplement and supplement and supplement, can we make it a, hair, a healthy hair that'll last for a while, but likely that the stem cells will deplete again over time? And we don't know that answer. So I think we're giving up on trying to grow new hair from nothing because so far that has been a spectacular failure. So I think at the moment the, 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 the more likely scenario is to boost stem cell populations in the miniaturized hair follicles in the hope that you can strengthen them and, and keep them stronger for a longer period of time. Because yeah, we're, we're going to digress a little bit but that's, I mean, that's always been the, the goal because you have in, um, in your office you've got that cartoon isn't it? The machine gun and the, the hair follicles in the, in the test in tube. The test yeah, tube. Test How old is hair? that? Uh, I had those cartoons made in 1993. Right. So here we are 27 years later and I'm still, still can't answer the question. I keep saying to people, five, ten years, five, ten years. I've been saying that for 27 years. I don't know. We haven't cracked the code yet. There's a lot of work around the world uh, uh, doing on it, but that, being done on it. But the take home message is if you want to be part of an experimental process and prepared to pay for the privilege, fine as long as you think it's safe that's okay but do not if you really want to only use things that have tried tested and proven the latest greatest thing on the internet is not the way to find that which is a great segue to talk about our next topic which is ru58841 which is a horrible name um, but it's a it's a it's meant to try and be an alternative for finasteride because we know that uh, male pattern hair loss, and we've talked about this a number of times, it's accentuated by that conversion of testosterone into to dihydrotestosterone. And we use finasteride to block that 5-alpha reductase enzyme to, uh, to lower that level of DHT. But where the issue is for a lot of people is that by lowering that level of DHT, it, has, uh, it can have side effects. 
uh, for a lot of people. And so in order to try and uh, reduce that, mitigate that, people are looking for alternatives. And five, RU58841 has come on the market, so to speak, in order to try and uh, find a place for that. It's basically a non-steroidal anti-androgen. So that's how it, it works. Uh, and it's not used mainstream. All right, and I don't want to necessarily go down in the, into a too, too technical uh, aspect about it. But there, are, there is data, but all the data are mainly animal studies. So they've taken and they've looked at hamsters and how it, it compares with finasteride use in hamsters. Or they've taken uh, graphs from uh, balding men and transplanted those into, into mice to see how, uh, how effective they are. And these are small studies, so not very powerful at all. Uh, and comparing with quite high doses of finasteride, so it's not, not a fair comparison as well. Um, so I think, you know, is it, the, is it the best thing? Well, we don't know because it's never been tried and tested on a large uh, population uh, of people. And it comes to your point. Do you, you know, do you want to be that, uh, you know, in that group of people who are right on that fringe, uh, who are looking to, to see how effective this is? Um, and I think, you know, you have to go for the low hanging fruit. With, with, this, with this sort of thing. And so if you're losing hair and you can tolerate finasteride, well then things like finasteride and minoxidil are probably the most effective things to go for. Try trialing something like RU58841, which you have to buy online and get it sent over. And I believe you have to get it, you know, get it made up and combat for, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really clear. So do we use it as part of our practice? No, uh, because we're not early adopters because we can't authentically say, hey, look, take this and it will improve your uh, hair loss or stabilize your hair loss by X amount. So, uh, you know, it is there. I, I know lots of people are wanting, you know, uh, definitive uh, information from us, whether or not we think it's good or not. I just don't have the answer. Yeah, and, uh, and the thing that. about the body is it's dynamic. So we're always a little bit leery about anti-androgens. I mean, people call finasteride a DHT blocker. It's not. It's a 5-alpha reductase blocker, which reduces the level of DHT. But when you're reducing the level of DHT, your level of T is going up. Now, one of the problems, which is testosterone, one of the problems we have in our brains about using anti-androgens is the law of unintended consequence. Right? If you use strong anti-androgens in men, it doesn't just block the effect of testosterone uh, on the receptors, it blocks, uh, sorry, dihydrotestosterone, it blocks testosterone mm -hmm. as well. So you can end up feminizing your men. So you've got to be really, really careful about how this anti-androgen is going to work, that it's not going to have uh, unintended consequences because once you change the uh, biochemistry of hormones, and there are a number of them, number of androgens circling around uh, in, in the body and being produced and, and being metabolized all the time, you want to make sure that you're not actually raising something you shouldn't be raising or blocking something you shouldn't be blocking at the same time. So as a general rule, I'd want some pretty good evidence yes. that anti-androgen therapy was a safe thing to do in a man. Yeah, we don't really want to be mavens in that, in that no. field. We'll let everyone else do all the, the harder. And if it's, it's, if it's proven therapy, then... And I want it in a properly controlled trial, correct. not somebody who's trying to sell it on the internet. You know, properly controlled trials do not sell the product during the trial. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they do not sell it to humans when they haven't done the human trials. So um, just be patient, people. Uh, it's very, very important to wait to have proper research done because we don't want anybody harmed. Uh, you know, I keep saying to people, I don't want to give you a dangerous drug to save your hair. It's okay as a, as a medical practitioner to potentially give you a dangerous drug to save you from a more dangerous disease, right? Uh, you know, but we don't want to give you a dangerous drug to save your hair follicles. Absolutely. So hopefully that uh, answers some of the questions that uh, you may have about uh, both of those. Uh, thanks again for watching and uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks guys. That's it.